Yeah, I, I'm going to not talk about political economy or capitalism very much, but more the cultural, social politics that this election uh, indicated, the victory of Trump and so on, and this is how it goes. And I'm going to begin with uh, how Trump conducted his electoral campaign and on the theme of his general style, because the style is the man, and I kind of agree with that. His campaign was built on the unusual nature of combining reality TV, locker room talk, complete demagoguery, and the lack of English grammar, far from the usual political rhetoric, clearly a circus clown show. Shock effect on the middle class was really strong as he grabbed attention through verbal violence, for example, in the manner of his reality show, The Apprentice, and his delivery in the end delivered him the votes. His vehement violence stripped to basic style, conveying a sense of reckless freedom, uh, jives well with American misguided notion of freedom, especially freedom to hate, to own guns, to bash blacks, and to vilify Hispanics, and so on. The incitement of all the above fits well with long debates on political correctness, which created a parching thirst among particularly white and ena enabled men for political incorrectness. Such people resented having to obey compulsions to decorum uh, as wimpish, eggheady, uppity women, natural, unnatural pleasure seekers. So there was, uh, and this is an old story, because I remember many, many years ago, Stanley Fish of Duke University and Dinesh D'Souza of uh, Washington always did a double number with each other around uh, political correctness versus incorrectness. They would finish their gig and then go off and drink together, <laughs> having taken some money in the middle for this whole thing. So this is an old story redone. Now Trump opened the trap door to let the beast escape and get, explode. His asides and stalking of Hillary Clinton during the campaign brought guffaws from his followers, but also embarrassed smirks and smiles from the more refined newscasters or political analysts. Trump's control of Burnham and Bailey style has, dis uh, has been discussed by students of fascism and Nazism as fascists need and ability to produce spectacles. There's been a lot of work done on the spectacular nature and I, of, of fascism, and I think that Trump shares that uh, style with them. And these spectacles, uh, though we have not come to the Nuremberg rally yet, his campaign rallies certainly had a spectacular character as well as a carnivalist one, where his audience, though not spewing and throwing um, uh, peanuts or immediately swigging beer still had a laugh out loud quality. Their body language was one of a wholehearted participation. The content of his political platform actually counted for very little in terms of actual methods for improving the economy, for example, but his well-timed refrains harping on time, time-honored social hatreds and prejudices residing in the common sense of America is what, oh, 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 sorry, what won him popularity. He showed mastery about keywords, using archetypal images of walls, borders, boundaries, swamps with their carnivores, the essentially criminal and rapacious nature of Hispanic people and blacks as rapists and murderers and drug dealers, creating a network of evocative discourses aimed at America's worst forms of political unconscious. The newscasters and pundits, exploring and explaining what for them were astonishing results coming in from the different states, maintained a continuous refrain of the rednecks and college uneducated, therefore stupid voters, and blamed them for voting Trump to victory. 
Along with this pejorative presentation of the great unwashed, they also use the trope of pain, representing the white working class as hurting, and in, in a manner similar sometimes to Trump, and therefore desperately reaching out for the lifeline of the segregated economy and class lines entrenched by Trump in his platform. But is it believable that the white working class was mainly responsible for the win of Trump? It has been pointed out by non-mainstream social media analysts, and in my opinion also, that many non-vulgar, civilized people voted for Trump even while they castigated his manners, they shared his morals. Racism and misogyny have been Trump's acing cards. Not for a second was he unaware of his ability to grab the right wing of America. The fact that he systematically ignored the hurt or pain doubly borne by black, un black unemployed people or others, that they shared the same job loss with white Americans, was not generally noted by the news media or analysts. He included black and Hispanic people of America within the trope of foreigners. The enemy within, though enemy aliens, job snatchers and criminals. For the Hispanics, he further stressed the trope of constant unbridled sexuality. For other non-white people, he reserved the epithet of terrorists, demoral demonizing an entire population with his equivalence between Islam and terrorism. The Khan family were depicted as undesirable on the ground of Islamic misogyny as Mrs. Khan was silent during the interview while excluding them as Americans by refusing to notice the patriotism within quotes showed by their son who died fighting for American hegemony in Iraq. One could multiply many instances of Trump's exhibition of racism, incitement for being openly racist, support for police killing of blacks on the streets of America. Congratulations to white police officers for doing the right thing. Trump's misogyny has been displayed, displayed in vivid colors from the beginning of the campaign to the end. Um, it came out not only against Hillary Clinton by using a time-worn image of the witch, an un, uh, unnatural male female her essentially corrupting female nature bonding with corporate corruption, for which he congratulated himself as a master at playing tax games during their debates, but also in his habitual treatment of women reporters as stupid, mendacious, and sneaky. To this might be added his special hatred for disabled women when he mocked and mimicked a woman journalist. His talk about how to treat a woman and put her in her place by grabbing her pussy at the first opportunity created some disgust and great diverse, uh, diversion at the same time. This jocular, woman-hating man held also a sinister side to it in his support and subsequent appointment of anti-abortion advisors and administrative personnel. With all his warts in full display, his lumpen racist traits striking fire from those of others, the surprise comes to an end when we see Trump as a president-elect. This phenomenon cannot simply be explained by talk about electoral malpractice, voter apathy, or reaction to the loss of Bernie Sanders, but must rely on the fact that Trump does represent a whole strand of American political ideology, social norms, and crisis of capitalism within which all this is happening. It is in the pressure cooker of the long existing crisis that the worst, most dystopic demagoguery of Trump stood for a true change. It should be noted the weapons wielded against him by Hillary Clinton's campaign rhetoric use not a dissimilar trope of Cold Warism against Trump himself for all the wild tapping of the usual lines about race and gender, Hillary used a violent anti-Islamism in her hawkish attitude and policies, uh, policies towards our countries in the Middle East. Her infamous adaptation of Julius Caesar's line, Veni Vidi Vici, upon his entry to Gaul, became, we came, we saw, he died, 
with her laughing regarding the public lynching and beheading of Gaddafi and draws from exponentially draws from and exponentially intensifies the same Islamophobia that Trump draws from himself. His protectionism, which is turning out to be an empty promise, is no more innocent for the American worker than her firm commitment to TTP, TPP and other multilateral trade agreements. Both Clinton and Trump are avid Israel supporters. The fate of the Palestinians would not be dissimilar under rule of either. To quote Barack Obama, who constantly says, going forward from here, uh, from this description of the political project of making America great again, can we come to the conclusion that Trump is a fascist? Uh, furthermore, does the rest of the U.S. who voted him into power have an affinity <laughs> with his fascism? If fascism is a populism conceived within the purview of capitalism in crisis, which stimulates and nourishes itself on social hatreds, seeks to eliminate measures for social well-being, and tends to remove even the minimal social assistance in health care and other amenities, then it is not a very far stretch to see the current political conjuncture as some kind of a rehearsal for fascism, though not an actually realized one yet. That Trump manipulates the notion of democracy and cashes in on the characteristic democratic ideas of freedom, soft speech, and public assembly to achieve his own end doesn't qualify him to be a non-fascist politician. We need to remember that neither Mussolini nor Hitler came to power by force. Furthermore, the huge outreach of the securitized state in the US, France, UK, and other countries, actually even Canada including, already has the framework of a totalitarian state in place, but it has not happened <coughs> yet. It is perhaps naive of us to assume that our daily life is safe and democratic, while laws and an information apparatus exist for criminalizing any of us or many of us at this point. The state of emergency put in place in the context of 9-11 and the consequent invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan mean not only a shock and awe for those outside of the national boundaries, it is also meant for those who live in the homeland. Fascism demands an enemy and ways to subdue and eliminate them. Trump and his vociferous as well as silent supporters and non-Trump supporters who supported Clinton, however, speak in the language of cultural wars between civilization and other societies, already have the enemy in place and the enemy within. From this point of view, the new anti-Semitism of Islamophobia will serve as the US as the sharp edge of the wedge, as once Jews did for Nazi Germany. This tip of the iceberg rests on the broader base of demonization, of protests, constant attempts at land grabs, dehumanization of, quote, aliens, the criminalization of the poor, and hatred of women's control over their own lives, both bodies, and social participation. However, it would be wrong to say that this fascist sociopolitical biology is the destiny of the U.S. or countries like it. For example, in Europe, struggling with the rising tide of ultra-right attempts to create new states and new societies. Inherent within this historical conjuncture lies a contradiction, a profound contradiction. Quoting Dickens, we could say that it is the worst of times and the best of times. Capitalist social contract, which held in place since the Second World War, more or less, with periodic gaps, especially in the United States, is not holding in place anymore. Promises and actualities of capitalism in neoliberalism have created in the US and other Western countries huge disappointments, <coughs> angers, and life degradations. Class struggle has not come to an end, but is at an extreme peak, while capitalist classes and their states are trying to win by any means necessary. But in their turns and twists, they are tearing the social fabric apart, which cannot be stitched together by the force of a militarized police of a culturally fascist state. At this point of nakedness, with the few liberal fig leaves being thrown aside, 
the emperor is clearly unclothed. In this darkness, one has to look for ways to end the sense of unlimited power that the capitalist states have arrogated themselves with this. These states must not only frighten us, but also enliven us within a multifaceted political resistance that ranges from culture to economy, from nature to industry, from prisons to public spaces, from mind-numbing fear to irreverent laughter. It is only in this way that we can write, like Brecht, the story of the resistible rise of Arturo Wi. I underline resistible. The cauliflower trait of Chicago, as Brecht puts it, is in crisis. And the mafiosi are rising. Donald Trump is aspiring to be our Al Capone. To undo him would be to dismantle the institutions and cultural support structures which propel him forward. The same would have been be said even if Hillary Clinton had won. This dark time, to quote Brecht again, has its own songs. Those of us, humble, ordinary people, fighting on grounds of social justice and entitlement, however small our activities, must join in a very great refusal. Thank you.